You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Friday, August 21st. We're going to dig into a great article in The Lutheran Witness this month. If you haven't read it, read it. Mm -hmm. Read it twice. You're going to need to read this article again, probably in October and November. Mm -hmm. It's very insightful and helpful. Uh, We're going to dig into that here in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin, for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us this morning, the Reverend Dr. Joel Bierman, professor of systematic theology at Concordia Seminary and a contributor to the Lutheran Witness this month, Beyond the Booth. You find it on, uh, I believe, page nine in this issue of the Lutheran Witness. Dr. Bierman, thanks for being our guest on the Coffee Hour today. Yeah, a pleasure to be with you guys. You have provided us with some great insights as we look at what's coming up, the the election coming up in November. And um, I I don't think there's anything unique about this election, right, this year? Well, everybody thinks that's the case. Um, My opinion is a little bit less uh, dramatic, I guess. So I would think that every election matters. So what is at the root of this American notion that no one should tell me how to vote because we we all have this idea that no one should should tell me how to vote it's 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 my privilege it's it's uh it's my right really to to vote how i want but yet every ad tells me how to vote every campaign ad what's at the the root of this notion (laughs) well the root of it's a big debate i guess there's lots of ways to try to unpack that and think about it my way of approaching it, and my opinion on this is that it has a lot to do with the rise of the Enlightenment, the whole way of thinking that has driven Western culture ever since about 1650, from the time of Rene Descartes. And the reason this matters, without getting too deep into the history of the philosophical ideas of it, is that basically Descartes premised his whole understanding of the world with himself at the center rather than with God at the center. And this was a major shift in the thinking of the world. And ever since then we have this steady progression of how this plays out in history of man becoming more and more the center of his universe and more and more the decider of everything. And one of the key components of the Enlightenment, frankly, is the significance and the um, supremacy of the individual and the idea of the sovereign individual who has these rights. So the idea of a democratic republic has roots really that grow straight out of the Enlightenment through Rousseau and Locke and some of these guys that are famous in our U.S. history and the philosophical ideas and the founding fathers, that's what's really driving most of this. And so this notion that I am my own person, my individual, I have my rights, those are all ideas that you do not find in Scripture, but you do find in the Enlightenment. That is so fascinating, and I wish we had another half hour to talk <laughs> just about that because there's so much of the the foundation and basis of everything that we do in our culture is based on all of these uh, ideals that come from all of these places. But that's not what we're here to talk about. So what? <laughs> no, what you're is quite actually... right. I agree, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> what is actually happening when we go to cast our votes? Well, as citizens of the United States, that means we're part of a democratic republic, which means this is premised on the idea that the people are the government. That's the the foundation of Rousseau's thinking when it comes to this idea of the, the will of the people, that all authority comes from the people and the people lend their authority to those that they put in power. That's that's the premise of the democratic experiment of America. And it's different, frankly, than Luther's view of it. Luther's view was authority came from the top down. God empowered individuals to be in authority, whether that was the prince or the king or the emperor, and those are the people who had the authority. And so then you would go from there. Now, we can debate about which one's better or which one's more right. It really doesn't matter. Romans 13 still applies. Whatever government is in place that God has is allowed to be established, that government rules with the sword, and so they're, they're the authority. So in America, we are part of the government, which means that when we vote, we're actually doing our responsibility as part of the government, and I would contend then that a Christian really has an obligation before God to vote as part of his responsibility toward the world around him. He can't just blow it off and ignore it. He needs to care about that world, and that he does that by voting. So when you vote, you're not just 
sharing an opinion, you are playing a part in choosing the direction and the law and the guidance of the country in which you live. So then does God care about or want me to vote in a certain way? I would say absolutely. And what that means then is that when you vote, you vote as a Christian who's following Christ. So that everything you're doing in your life as a Christian should always be normed by Christ, including your political responsibilities. So I pay my taxes the way God wants me to. I pay attention to what's going on in the news around me. And I vote the way that God want me to. There's absolutely a Christian way to vote, I would argue. So then coming to this point, and you've mentioned that uh, there's there's our um, our life in this uh, temporal realm. There's also our life as Christians. Uh, yeah. How what is that relationship and the, the distinction between those two aspects of how we live our daily lives? Yeah, that opens up an, another enormously important door into understanding how Christian doctrine impacts just the way we live. And this is something that I've always been very committed to throughout my uh, teaching and my ministry is the the reality that do God's doctrine is not some esoteric ivory tower thing that's just for theologians to kick around because it's interesting. No, God's doctrine is simply his truth and his will for how he's put the world together and how it works. And so when we are understanding God's truth and God's doctrine, it absolutely impacts and shapes how we live our lives in ordinary routine things. So God's will for man and woman impacts how I function in my marriage. God's will for the creation impacts how I look at the creation. So we have to go to some foundational truths like this is God's world. It's not a world that came from Satan. God created the world. He loves this world. He sent Christ to redeem this world. So he cares about it. And he's established government to make sure that the world's function the way it should, which means according to his will, that's what government should do. And so the, the two realms means that God then is at work in this world in two very distinct ways, caring about his world and using government to do that, and caring about his gospel being proclaimed so that people know how to be made right because of the sinfulness and the brokenness that they've introduced into the world. And that's what the church does, of course, in proclaiming the gospel. So the church is doing its thing, proclaiming the gospel, making Christ known, and the world is doing its thing. The government's doing its thing, taking care of this world, making sure it's functioning according to God's rules. And of course, this gets interesting when we would say as Christians that the government's dropping the ball and not actually doing things the way God would want it done. And so that's part of the challenge we face. And that doesn't mean we wash our hands of it and just kind of walk away, nor does it mean we rebel and try to establish a new Christian government. That's not the goal either. The goal is for the government simply to be doing things the way God would have it done according to his rules for how this world works. So one might say, well, the things of this world are all temporary. They're, they're all mm -hmm. temporal. They're all passing away. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if I vote. It doesn't matter if I vote this way or that way. They're all temporary. They're all going to go away anyway. The only thing that really matters is the spiritual. What's yeah, your response yeah. to that? Well, yeah, that's a very common idea in our culture. Another thing that has roots back in philosophical ideas known as Gnosticism and the idea that the spiritual is somehow superior and supreme to the material. The material is just a uh, dirty, broken, you know, creation of a lesser God and it's no, no good. It needs to be gotten rid of. And this has infiltrated Christian thinking in lots of places where we have this sense that, yeah, the material world bad and broken and nasty and someday we'll get up to this spiritual spiritual reality and we'll have this um, kind of a spiritual existence. This is not a Christian idea at all. It's not a scriptural idea at all. It's, it's, the scripture is very clear that the creation is God's good creation. He loves it. The material world is God's material world. And if you want to really put a, a high exclamation point on this, just think about our the core of our Christian confession is Jesus Christ in the flesh incarnate, which means he's got human flesh. How material is that? How bodily is that? And he has that flesh not just for his 30 years of ministry. He has it for eternity. God has brought human flesh into the Godhead, which means that the creation matters. And that may, means that we've got to give 
a great deal of effort and concern toward the world in which we live. It's, it's God's world. We can't have this dismissive attitude. And this, of course, is taught also in Scripture that at the last day, when Christ returns in glory, there will be a new heavens and a new earth, and there's a resurrection of the body, a bodily resurrection, not just a wafting up into the heavenly heights and floating around with, you know, like a spiritual <laughs> ghost kind of a thing. It's a new creation of bodies in, in God's new, new world. Is it possible to fall off the horse on the on the opposite side of that as well of of uh, the op, uh, whatever the uh, the opposite side of the narcissism that that nothing matters the opposite side of that horse as well when we approach our role as citizens? Well, yeah, we can become obsessed with trying to make this a better world, and there are some of our Christian brothers and sisters who do this to the point that they begin to believe that they're going to create God's kingdom here in this world. And we see people, frankly, on the on the left and the right spectrum of, of the political thought who would do this kind of thing, where you've got some people who are maybe more left-leaning would say, we just need to make the best world we can, and you know, when we learn to show love to everybody, we're creating a new heaven and earth because they really don't believe Christ is coming in glory. Then you have others on the right side of the spectrum who might say it's our job to make a Christian America and we need to make fight for Christian principles and you know if everybody should be able to um, know that Jesus is Lord and we're going to have the government enforcing this well no that's not the goal either that's why we need to keep the two realms straight and know what the goal of each is and so yeah it's possible to become so concerned about trying to build the right world here that we forget about the proclamation of the gospel and there are churches that get distracted by that too and get a little bit too caught up in trying to um, make things better here and now and forget about the responsibility they have of proclaiming the gospel while taking care of the world as best they can. Mm, good stuff. I, I mean, I've even heard you know, th- thoughts that uh, conflating America with uh, Israel, that uh, America oh, yeah. is God's chosen nation, the, the new Israel. Oh, this was a very common idea, especially at the founding of our country, that, you know, this is the new city on a hill, and this is the new Israel, and the the, uh, the rhetoric was really thick and heavy. Uh, and so there was a whole lot of effort to try to put a Christian veneer on this American experiment, which is why people get confused and think that, well, this is a Christian nation, and it always has been. And I would contend, not really. Certainly there are Christian ideas at work, and many Christians were involved in the founding of the nation, no doubt about that. But the principles on which this country is founded aren't particularly Christian. Um, some of them overlap nicely from the Enlightenment to Christian ideas, but it's not a Christian principles that's driving it. It's really the ideas of the Enlightenment that's driving it. And so you end up with this kind of confusion of what is America? Is America God's chosen nation? No, America is one nation among many where God is accomplishing his purpose. And America's done a lot of great things and a lot of very good things according to God's justice. No doubt about that. But it's not some sort of privileged nation. And Americans Christians need to be very careful not to get mixed up about their faith and their patriotism and sort of running them all together. They're two very different things. And when we conflate them, things get really messed up. Hmm. Good stuff. And we have more to uh, to dig into in Beyond the Booth from the August issue of The Lutheran Witness with the Reverend Dr. Joel Bierman, professor of, professor of Systematic Theology at Concordia Seminary. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. How do you compare to your next door neighbor, your brother-in-law, or the person you were five years ago? Comparing ourselves against God's requirements can prompt us to turn in repentant faith to Jesus, the Savior beyond compare. Archives August continues with Dr. Wallace Schultz this week on The Lutheran Hour. Sundays at 1230 and 5 p.m. on Worldwide KFUO. Cross Defense is the show where we talk about curious topics to excite the imagination, equip the mind, and comfort the soul with God's Word. Join me, Pastor Tyrell Bramwell, every Monday at 2 p.m. Central on KFUO Radio, or anytime on KFUO.org, or even your favorite podcast app. My friends, our foe is a fierce enemy. Our only defense is Christ on the cross. 
Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're talking with... We Re- have... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I'm talking right over you. We're talking with the Reverend Dr. Joel Beerman, <laughs> Professor of Systematic Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, looking at the Lutheran Witness August 2020 issue Beyond the Booth. Now I'll hand it over to Sarah. Sorry. I'm just so excited to talk about this because it's such it's such a, a, a topic that everyone is talking about, I wonder why, right now. Uh, we, we're talking about if God tells us to vote, if God cares about how we vote, uh, how does God tell us uh, how to vote or how to exercise our right to vote? Well, if you pray just the right way, he will give you the <laughs> thoughts in your head and you'll know exactly what to do because he'll whisper it to you. <laughs> Yeah, um, obviously, it's not going to be quite so so neat and clean. Uh, it's, it's, it's an involved process of how God makes his will known to us. He makes it known to us clearly in Scripture. And so is he going to tell you which candidate to vote for? Well, you're not going to find names like Bump. Trump or Biden in the Bible, but you are going to find the, the truth that he has for how justice should work and what it should look like in this world and what is right and what's wrong. Ten Commandments are a great place to start, but then you go from there. So that's, that's a key part of it. Another key part of this, which we maybe don't emphasize enough in our Lutheran tradition, is the role of the church. The, the church actually teaches individual Christians how to think about things, what is the right way to understand things. And the church is not just my congregation today, but it's 2,000 years and plus more of the church's teaching down through time, all of Christendom saying, this is how we understand these things. This is how Christians operate. This is what Christians do. This is what Christians do in the face of persecution. This is what Christians do in the case in the face of injustice. And we learn from these things, and these things shape how we operate. So the, the way I think about myself, my responsibility in the world as a Christian should be driven less by what the country tells me and the history books tell me and what the news media outlets I like tell me and much more by what scripture and the church tells me. And then we can get into the specifics of even, you know, Christian people we trust and respect and the input they give us on think this way about these issues, think this way about this candidate. And that helps us think about what we should be doing the right way to be doing it. So, I just, I'll just i just throw a little quick antidote. When I was in, in the parish, I served in Michigan. We had, I had strong unions in the area. And, I, and you know, unions were very prominent in these, in these men's lives and played a big key part in these men's and my, men in my congregation. I remember one time teaching about the idea of God directing how we vote. And he came up to me and said, you mean I shouldn't just do what the union tells me to do? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, no. And, but he was in earnest. It wasn't like he was being facetious or something. He, he was in earnest. And it was a new thought to him that his Christian faith should actually dictate what he does rather than the union. And that was just, it just kind of blew him away. And that blew me away to think that that wasn't patently obvious to him, but it's not. And I think that's the case for a lot of our people, whether it's the union telling you how to vote or your favorite interest group or the um, uh, whatever identity politics group you identify with, whatever they tell me to do, that's what I'm going to do. No, we need to be much more circumspect and say, what is God wanting me to do, that's what should be directing me. Mm. So then how do I know what it is that God wants me to do? All right. I have to think. <laughs> yeah, you uh. absolutely have to think. You've got to pay attention <laughs> to what's going on. Uh, I suggest in my article a little kind of a triage, I called it, or a list you might work your way through. And so I would say the first thing we need to realize is that when we're acting in the world, and this is fundamental, basic Christian idea that we, when you think about it, you go, oh, yeah, your goal is not to serve yourself. Your goal is to serve your neighbor. And so, in other words, this gets down to the, the core of vocation. When you vote, you're doing part of your vocation as a Christian living in the world. So I'm voting to serve my neighbor. So I should be asking myself the question, how can I best serve those who are in acute need by the way I vote? And so you're not thinking about what's going to be better for me, what's going to make my life more convenient. Instead, you're thinking about what am I going to do? How am I going to help the one around me who is in need and the neighbor in need? And when we take our cue from the story of the Good Samaritan, we know it's the near neighbor, the one we see, the one that we can intervene and work for who is needful. That's the neighbor that takes priority. So that's the first thing I think about. And then I would say that we need to also think hard about the question of um, the the, the significance of the need of the neighbor and the neighbor who is maybe having his you know rights infringed upon 
if it's like his right to walk through a park that he likes to walk through or his right to, you know, work where he likes is not quite as significant as the neighbor who is having his very life threatened. And that's where the abortion issue comes in, frankly. And people sometimes get tired of, you know, all of that issue again. Oh, I don't want to be a single issue voter. And my response to that is kind of kind of simple, that when you've got a government that is saying that it's okay to violate the Fifth Commandment and kill human beings just because they happen to be in utero, that's a problem. I mean, that is a significant problem. And I pray and wish and work for the day when we won't have to have single issue voting. But as far as I'm concerned, that really kind of takes precedence right now over lots of other things. And it's really hard to say, well, protecting wetlands is important too. Sure, that is. No, no doubt. And we can debate that. But killing babies? Come on, people. Let, we got to weigh these things out. And so it's not a matter of just being a single issue voter. It's a matter of making the right choices on what are these, what are the priorities? What are the things that really count? So then uh, what, what then happens, <clears throat> excuse me, what then happens when we take this, this hierarchy or triaging and think through the issues, think through our, our neighbors, who we have a direct impact on around us? What mm -hmm. then happens when we all go and cast our vote? So we, we, are we all going to vote the same way? No, it's probably not. And see, that's, that's one of the beauties of Christians actually seeking to follow Christ. We're all in different locations in, in the world, in time, in our vocational responsibilities, in our family situations. In our, we see different needs. We see different priorities. And we're going to look at things differently. So we're not going to have this kind of uniform block thinking about things. And that's why you're not, I would say, Christians are rarely going to find one political party that aligns with everything that they think is correct. It's, it's not going to happen. There are going to be things here that are right, things that are here that are better. This candidate, okay, maybe that one, eh, not so much. And so we're going to be weighing, th weighing things out. And like when you have kind of really significant, huge issues, there's probably going to be, it's going to be simpler. It's going to be like, well, it's going to be hard for a Christian to support that sort of a thing, like expanding abortion rights. No, I would argue a Christian can't in good conscience do that. You're violating the fifth commandment. Can't be done. Now, but if you move into other things like, well, should we be having a uh, law, uh, $15 minimum wage? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, there's room for some discussion there because you might say, well, yeah, it's going to help people. Well, someone else might say, well, actually, it's going to hurt them. Stats show this. And so now we have an interesting debate. And we might come down on different spots on that. That's fine. And so Christians have to be willing to disagree on some things and disagree on a whole lot of policy things, but then agree on the core, really critical things like God is the creator, God's in charge, his rules run the show. How we apply those rules and how we apply his law in any given situation, all kinds of discussion there and all kinds of differences possible there. Mm. So to I don't know if it really sums it up, but then why vote why should why is that an important part of my vocation why should i vote? yeah it's you're 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 one of you know how many million voters in this country mm -hmm. and yet you're discharging your responsibility to say i need to cast my my vote for those men or those women and those policies and those ballot initiatives that are going to more nearly adhere to God's definition of his truth and his justice for the sake of my neighbor. That's who you vote for. And so the guy who's promising you a tax break maybe isn't the guy you vote for, even though he's going to make your life more comfortable. Or the guy who's promising to defend your right for self-expression maybe isn't the guy you vote for, even though you'd like that personally. Instead, you ask yourself the question, which candidate is going to be actually more nearly advanced God's purposes for this world and be more nearly cohering to God's definition of truth. And this, by the way, I'll throw in as well, the personal character of the individual candidate really doesn't matter nearly as much as the policies he's enacts or the way he actually um, governs. That's far more important, which is why Luther would say, I'd rather, you know, famously, no one can really quite find this, but it's what he would say, I'd rather be ruled by a foolish Turk, I mean, a wise Turk than by a foolish Christian. And so you might say, well, how could a Christian ever vote for a Muslim? Well, you would vote for him if he's a good leader and he's practicing justice, which it's possible for him to do. Whereas so you could have a Christian who's a fool and he would be a lousy leader. And so it's not the individual beliefs or even necessarily actions of the person you're voting for that matter as much as the policies that he sustains and the things that he advances by his, his actions. 
That is a whole lot to think about as we approach uh, another election. Uh, all of these, all of these things to think through, and and it really comes down to doing our homework and being an informed voter, and not just uh, running through your sample ballot five minutes before you go vote. There is a lot of <laughs> no, I, exactly. Lot. <laughs> this is, I, I would say that part of our vocational responsibility is to pay attention to what's going on and to be aware of the issues and be aware of the implications of this action or that action. It, it takes a fair amount of work. That's part of living in a democratic republic. If we were living back in Luther's day, you just did what you were told and paid your taxes, didn't have to worry about it because you didn't get to vote anyway. So it, it's more complicated for us. Yeah, we have just a, a minute or two left. Uh, how do we how do we then approach uh, uh, talking about this with our neighbors, uh, sharing our views and, and kind of bouncing our ideas off of each other since that, that can also be a helpful way to, to kind of yeah. narrow down our uh, sure. who we'll be voting for? It probably depends on who your neighbors are. If you're talking to other Christians, I think you can push them a little bit on, are you following Christ by the way you vote? Are you honoring God by the way you vote? If you're talking to non-Christian neighbors, then you just kind of challenge them on, you know, what is, the, what is right? What's fair? What's just? And you ask questions about, you know, justice, about killing children before they're even born. Is that a just thing? And you ask questions about immigration policy, and is that a fair thing? And so you push them a little bit on things they can't understand, like the basic, what I would call is the natural law that's at work, and you challenge them on some of those sorts of things. Hmm. But we should talk to our neighbors, and we should be trying to influence them to think about their responsibility for the sake of the wider culture. Good stuff. It's in this is in the uh, the Lutheran Witness August issue, Beyond the Booth. Read it now, and then read it again in October, November. <laughs> It's it's so helpful. Uh, check it out. And, and Dr. Bierman, you have some uh, some teaching opportunities not only for students at the seminary, but uh, some of the the uh, Lay Bible Institute coming up. Is that correct? That's correct. There's one being offered here at the seminary in October, and it's, it's scheduled to be a live session at this point, which would be, I think, pretty fun. So, uh, yeah, that'll be a similar topic. We can delve into it a little more thoroughly there. Very good. Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, CSL.edu. Dr. Bierman, yeah. always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for being our guest on the Coffee Hour this morning. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Enjoyed it very much. Again, check it out. Uh, the August issue of The Lutheran Witness, Beyond the Booth, by the Reverend Dr. Joel Behrman, Professor of Systematic Theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. <laughs> Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.